Hi everyone who's joining us at the moment. Welcome to our joint online event this evening with Tristan Hughes and Rich and Brian Roberts to celebrate Shattercone and Hello Friend We Missed You. Um, we're just going to wait a few moments before we get the ball rolling while uh, more people join us. Um, I'm Catherine and we're doing this event tonight collaboration with Shelf Life Books and Zines in Cardiff um, who if we'd been able to would have been hosting it physically for us and selling the books um, so with that in mind if you do want to buy a copy of either of the books that we're talking about this evening you can go online um, and order them at Shelf Life and they've got some signed copies and there'll be a code for free delivery for wherever you are during lockdown or not um, and I'll be posting those on the chat um, later on in the event and I'm in the chat. Um, we've got a few more people joining us, which is great. And okay, brilliant. I'm going to hand you over to Richard Davis, who is our publishing director, and he's going to get the ball rolling and int introduce our authors. Um, okay, Rich. Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first uh, lockdown launch of the of the second lockdown. This one's going to be a lot better than the first one. Um, so we've started off tonight. We're all we're both we're all in Cardiff. We were supposed to be in a lovely bookshop that has just opened in the Castle uh, Emporium called Shelf Life. Uh, it's run by, uh, it's just been set up by Rosie and it specializes in uh, independent presses, magazines, self-published books. Um, so once everything's up and open again, please, if you get chance, call in and um, say hello to Rosie at Shelf Life. So thank you, Rosie, for um, co-hosting this event tonight. Um, and also thanks to Catherine for, for organizing it. Uh, just a quick note on the sponsors. Thank you very much to the Welsh Books Council. Um, or the Books Council of Wales now, who are um, sponsoring this series of launches and Zoom events, which we've been running uh, throughout the summer, uh, and we've got a few more coming up over the next couple of months. Uh, so the event tonight is, uh, is the launch of two very interesting uh, books, one novel, one collection of short stories. Um, the, the novel is a first novel by uh, Richard Owen Roberts. He's written a um, He's written one collection of short stories before this. The book is Hello, Friend, uh, We Missed You. Uh, it is set on uh, there in Venice Mon in North Wales. Um, and that's a little bit of a connection to the other writer that we're introducing tonight, is Tristan Hughes. Uh, it's his um, second collection of short stories. Probably uh, Tr Tristan's been writing novels for several years. Uh, he's a senior lecturer creative writing at uh, Cardiff University. And uh, his last novel, Hummingbird, won the Stanford um, Fiction Prize for a, a fiction with a sense of place. So interestingly, both books, um, both books have a, a very different uh, sense of place. Remove that round, uh, and that's that is Shatterkill. So. Um, if I move first, first to Tristan. Tristan um, won a number of awards, including the Reese, the Reese Davis Short Fiction Award and the, uh, as I said, the Stanford's Award, uh, being shortlisted for the Book of the Wheels a number of times. Uh, so Tristan, uh, fiction is always uh, a sense of place. Always seems to be very important in your work. Can you can you sort of comment on that, please? Yeah, um, absolutely. I think it's uh, in many ways the uh, the the driving idea behind a lot of my uh, behind a lot a lot of my work and I I tend to alternate so I, I, I always tend to have one kind of honest morn book and then one um, northern Canada northern Ontario book um, so I think it's always in form of writing and I think when I began writing absolutely uh, stories for me always began with a place and out of that vision of the place the story would 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 arrive out of that um so yeah i think it's always been in a sense the one of the major drivers of my of, of my fiction um 
and and one that I'm persistently interested in. Uh, I, I don't ever seem to exhaust my places. I think they get more interesting to me every time I write about them. Um, just to comment on the fact that you you've, you have two sense two separate places, if it, as it were, and you were you were brought um, you were born in Canada, but actually brought up. Uh, Back and forth between um, the east coast of Canada and, and mm. uh, North Wales, did you think that's how do you think that has affected you as a as you know as a writer or as a person? Um, I think it has in some ways, and you know, some ways are obviously kind of unquantifiable. But I think uh, um, I always moved between those places ever since I was a child. We'd um, usually go every summer to. Uh, to spend that time with my mum's family in in Canada, and then uh, spend the rest of the year on uh, on a small one. Um, which probably left me with a as the only person whose predominant kind of experience of northern Canada was sunshine. It was always summer um, um, there, but I think that shifting back and forth, I I think it it allows you to kind of be from a place and not be from it at the same time because you're constantly moving uh, between them. And I think the older I've got, I've realized that, that that's always quite helpful as a writer. You want a little bit of um, detachment, I guess, uh, and, and to be able to see somewhere from the inside and the outside at the same time. So I think, uh, yeah, I think Possibly that has helped me as a writer. I think um, using that connection of, of the island of the Anis Morn, um, return to looking at Richard's Richard, your your, your first novel. You you're from Anis Morn as, as well, living in Cardiff. I'm not sure, maybe ten years now. Um, th this novel is five years on from a you know critically acclaimed and very innovative collection of short stories called um, Places All the Places We Have Lived. Um, there's, there's journeys, there's always journeys in books, and the character in your book, Hello Friend, We, we Missed You, is, is coming back. He's, well, he's, go, he's coming back to his home place. Is that a journey that you know, you've know you made consciously yourself? or um, and how, how do you reflect? Do you need that distance from, from the island then? Oh, um, oh, I don't know. I kind of feel like, for me personally, um, I'm always, always on, on this morning, um, even when I'm not but yeah i think for the character of hill it's very much a case of returning and dealing and like owning all of his stuff that he's got going on um which i guess i mean you know everyone everyone can do that and everyone has these kind of things going on with where they were born and raised quite often um but yeah like similar to tristan really i think um it's it's an amazing place to write about and I can't really imagine writing a novel that wasn't set there is how I feel now. Um, and I guess the, the more the more kind of I think about it, the more I'm really rooted deeply in that place, I guess spiritually and stuff. Um, I mean, I've not lived there since, uh, well, it'd be more like 20 years really since, since going to uni. But, um, but still, uh, always, always um, mega, mega important to me, uh, and and how I work and think is like a, as an artist is yeah, big time, yeah, big fan of this one. Hill, um, you, you, Hill is the, the main character in 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 your novel, and he's he's returning to Anismon to perhaps um, come to terms with the old things that have happened in his life, um, and he finds. The place has shifted. Is that is that fair? Yeah, no, I, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I think, I guess, he's kind of because he hasn't been there um, for quite some time. His his version of the island is the island from his childhood. Um, but I guess, as much as it has shifted, um, I guess someone of Hill's age would have been there in in the 80s with, I guess, like the first wave of um, like second home ownership and that kind of stuff. But I guess how that is realized now in 2020 is, 
is like the wave of the 1980s, but in like hyper, hyperdrive. Um, and I guess you have things like um, a Waitrose, which I love, um, but also like the, this, the boutique kind of village vibe and food festivals and that kind of stuff. A lot of which is really, really pretty cool to have, but I guess it, it does speak to how the island has changed. Um, and and I, I just find that that's really, to me, it's just interesting to write about and it's just funny and it's there. It's not like an attack on anyone or anything. It's just um, things that amuse me and I would feel motivated to write about. Um, and here, and I saw in, through in the novel, you see Hill looking at them and, and Trudy as well. And they both, I guess, have their opinion on the island and so on. But yeah, it's a really, really, I mean, Tristan will speak to this for sure, but it's like a very, it's a perfect place for literature because it's, I think it's about 45 to 50,000 population, really, really different, um, disparate kind of people and communities and areas. It's almost like a, a, a nation within our nation. Um, and, it, and the fact that it is an island just adds to its iconic status, mm -hmm. I feel. Um, it's also, I, I feel the novel has a, a lot to say about a modern communication um, and of, of how people communicate, not, not uh, how, pe how people communicate or perhaps don't. Um, and as because Trudy and Hill, they have a particular way of getting together or not. And this is a father figure that maybe, who maybe is going to appear, maybe not. Is, is that something that you feel that like modern life is becoming? Oh yeah, definitely. I think um, it's, I guess, how people communicate, and I guess with the, with the with different means of communication can actually lead to less communication because you can kind of curate how you talk and how you communicate with people to such an extent that you miss out on like true kind of interaction, um, which I guess as Hill goes on that journey um, through the novel, you know, uh, spoiler alert, he, he, do, he does change as he goes along um, to, to an extent. But then him, I guess it's not kind of casting a judgment on how people communicate or don't, it's just an observation of it. Um, and like he, what he finds is by returning to the island, I think he kind of engages with like the nature and um, the life of the island in a way that allows him to kind of let go of um, the kind of the, the barriers to communication that he has set up for himself. Um, Tristan, I think also within within each narrative, you, each story you have, there are people who are not quite communicating properly, are they? There's, all, there's, there's that sort of, that missed moment, that missed opportunity in, in, in relationships and travel and life. And is that something that's, that has fascinated you, something you've like, quite, lived in many places? Yeah, I like the, I, I mean, looking over it now, I mean, it's full of those, yeah, those, as you say, kind of missed opportunities and, and, and moments where people all, almost connect but don't quite, or they do connect and it, and it falls apart, or, or, or they're drawn apart by geography or, or, or by history or um, by some kind of quirk of fate. And... Um, I think I've always been interested in that. And um, I've always been interested in how good kind of short stories are at, at capturing those tentative, fugitive kind of connections we have um, with places and with, and with other people. And I think that's something, um, that's something I really want to bring out in the book. And in a way, I think, just now I'm um, listening to kind of Richard I think that's I think that's also a bit of an island thing too you know I'm um, 
um, an island, you know, it's it's close to the mainland, but but still separate from it. That sense of, of separation and connection is kind of inherently there. And I hadn't really realized until I went back kind of over the book as a whole that it, um, it is full of these islands. Um, um, and, and, and I think, yeah, I, I mean, back to that. And I think even the characters in there as well are, are, are quite islanded in some ways. Um, if I can <laughs> turn that into a verb. <laughs> um, in, the, in the opening story, which is um, a, ter a terrific, a terrific story called A Pure, uh, which uh, w has won an O.M. Henry Award, which is, I think it must be the first Welsh writer ever to win an O.M. Henry Award because it's only given to Canadians and um, United, and Americans, I think. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. But it's, it's it's a real prestigious award, one of the best choices. So it's, it's the award for the best short stories of that year in North American fiction. Um, so mm -hmm. congratulations on winning for that the wonderful story. Um, mm -hmm. And it's the, the people in that. There's a dilemma in that story. You know, is how how much can you love somebody this much to do this? Do you want? Um, you don't have to give the story away, but you, perhaps you can talk. Perhaps, perhaps you talk a bit, and then, and then introduce, and I have a short reading from the, the story. Oh, uh, absolutely. I, 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 I won't give too much away. Um, and uh, um, a slight trigger warning that that, that yeah, a, 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 quite a bad thing is about to happen to a dog in this story. But 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 I will <laughs> hopefully not right in the beginning. Um, yeah, I think it is. And again, I, th I, th I think for me, it was a story about um, people looking for a way to, to kind of hide in a, in a geography, to, to, to kind of avoid maybe looking at their lives, trying to escape it um, in, a, in a particular geography. Um, here, it's a, it's a wilderness. So um, the main, the narrator has gone to live in um, in the forests of northern Ontario and I think there's a sense there where you know he's trying to get away from facing um, all of these things that have happened in his, his life but kind of rather inevitably they begin to resurface in, in, in kind of different ways and we, um, we, we kind of come to see this through the story um, and the dilemma kind of arrives in the form um, of a dog, of his girlfriend's dog. Um, but I'll read the beginning because uh, it makes more sense maybe if I um, just kind of read it out. I would like to say that the, uh, the fate of dogs is much better in Richard's book. Um, um, so, yes, I think uh, <laughs> dogs have a, have a better fate in um, Hello Friend, We Missed You, uh, than they do here. Um, so I'm just going to read the very first uh, <coughs> couple of pages uh, from right at the beginning of the story. Um, and it's called Up Here. The decision had been made the night before, though I'd played very little part in it. We'd been lying in bed, and she'd said it had to be done and because the day had been long and we were tired and a bit drunk. I, th I thought it might not stick and hoped it wouldn't. It seemed like the kind of thing you decided at night and safely forgot in the morning, but it wasn't forgotten. We were going to shoot the dog or rather I was going to shoot the dog. That didn't have to be spoken of at all. Up here, it was the kind of thing you did for your lover. In other places, you might be expected to do different things. I had never shot a dog before, but I was determined to now because I'd never done any of those other things in those other places. I wanted to show to her, to myself, that I was getting better at being in love. I wanted to show her how committed I was. I couldn't bring her $20,000 bills, but I could shoot a dog for her. 
I'll do it, I'd said, before she'd even had to ask. That was my part of the decision. Sun wasn't fully up yet, and the mosquitoes were bumping frantically against the screens and the windows. They were always at their most bold, desperate, during these early hours. It gave an added grating octave to the high, whining hum of their wings. My girlfriend, who worked as a naturalist in the park that surrounded us, had explained to me that they were mainly crepuscular insects. Crepuscular, I'd said. They use that word in biology. Up until then, I'd never heard it outside of a poem. It was like that with words here sometimes. They turned up in ways and forms you didn't expect. For instance, what exactly did park mean in a place where they were as big as countries? Fucking crepuscular insects, I whispered. My head was hurting. I'd been more than a bit drunk. They're only doing what they have to do, my girlfriend said, turning around to face me. She must have been awake for a while, but I hadn't noticed because she'd been lying with her back to me. Now I could see she'd been crying and knew that what had been decided had been remembered and that it, ha and that it had stuck. After a second or two, she turned her back to me again and I reached over and gently touched her head and we ended up making love in that slow, muffled, mourning way at once coy and intimate, where your bodies touch, your stale breath is carefully exhaled in other directions. It began slowly, but then she started pushing herself back onto me, strongly and roughly, as though it was after midnight and we were making a different kind of love. Afterwards, she jumped out of bed and held up her hand so I wouldn't follow her. Give me 15 minutes, she said. She wanted to say goodbye. And for the first time, it dawned on me that I actually would have to shoot the dog. Okay, I said, when she returned. Okay, she said, returning her head to her damp pillow. We lay there for another few minutes. I would brush a strand of dark hair from her forehead. I said, okay, she said. I got up. Make sure you feed her first. I just couldn't. For a moment, I hesitated. Night picturing the thundering hooves and quivering lance as his lady ties the ribbon onto his arm. We could take her to the vet. We decided, she said. Up here, even mosquitoes did what they had to do. Thank, th thank you very much, Tristan. It's a, it's a very moving story and uh, set up and told very beautifully. Um, Richard, there's a, there's a big dilemma as well in, in, in your novel, somewhere, somewhere near the middle, I guess, where Hill and Trudy, um, and it's about, I think, perhaps a modern, a modern dilemma, um, which, which again, you said a very <laughs> Unexpectedly, it's it's you're at, you're at the there's a beach party, there's a beach party in the night, and people decide to get rid of things, and and Hill, Hill is faced with the dilemma of getting rid of something that's very important to him, um, and I don't want to give away what happens, but can you? And I think that is a modern thing. People do it. What he wants to is asked rid of is his phone. But it, it, it lives partly through his phone. Do you want to, do you want to comment on how he, he wanted to make that point? Yeah, um, I think it was just not so much making a point, more um, it just seemed, it was just showing Trudy's, I think, understanding of Hill and who he was. Um, and guiding him to understand himself and to be able to just let go of things. So, for example, um, letting go of 
uh, the phone in this case is kind of a precursor or a way of enabling him to let go of other more important emotional baggage or um, stresses or um, dilemmas that, that he carries around with him. Um, and also it was just, I thought it'd be really, it was funny to have Hill in that situation having to do that. Um, Cause I knew it would be something he would struggle with and not want to do, but he also wouldn't want to lose face uh, around Trudy or in front of her friends who um, he, he, do, he you know, intensely doesn't, doesn't really like. So, so it was just, it was just funny, I think where it came from, but then as it kind of, I guess naturally, because you're in the head of the, of the character, um, it, it means like other things as well. But for me as a writer, I just really enjoyed his pain uh, having to process that and either do or, or, do, or don't throw it away. Um, I won't like say whether he does or not, but uh, I think people <laughs> could. Yeah. It's, it's a it's a beautifully told and set up scene, but it, we also learn a lot about the two main characters through that scene, which is what, which is yeah. as the sign of a good scene, really, of good thing. We, we, we move on, it moves it, it moves everything on. Perhaps you'd like to give us a, um, a, a, re a short reading from um, from the start. I think, is, is you said you were gonna read the start, Richard? Yeah, um, yeah, definitely, I'll read from the start. I'll just readjust. Um, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, all of the, just to explain um, for anyone who hasn't read the book yet, uh, the chapters have all got headings, so I'll just say the heading and I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, music to crash to. Looking through the small oval window, deciphering only vague traces of geography and infrastructure through the clouds, Hill blinks slowly. Turning, he looks towards the pilots, two calm men sitting silently, staring ahead, occasionally pressing buttons on the dashboard. Hill touches his iPhone, opening then closing a free backgammon app, opening then closing a free solitaire app, opening then closing a free drafts app. Hill touches his iPhone and puts ambient sounds, rain in a barrel, on repeat. Thank you, rain, thank you, barrel, Hill thinks. Hill looks towards a South American couple sitting opposite him. The woman, her loose dark brown hair streaked with silver, is pointing a GoPro at the window recording. The man wearing a faded college sweater, black jeans and scuffed multicolored Nikes places his hands around the woman's neck. The woman playing along and flopping her tongue out conveying, dead, you got me, as she holds the GoPro in position, still recording, still documenting. Hill looks away, touches his iPhone and puts sine wave 2000 on. Hill looks back towards the couple, now pointing at the folksy illustrations of Celtic burial mounds and aspirational sea salt branding that cover one side of an expanded tourist pamphlet. Guide to Anglesey, ad weniad ionis morn, Hill thinks. Hill listens as they repeat, Bear Grylls Island rib ride, back to each other over and over, grinning. Hill turns up the volume on his iPhone, looks straight ahead and closes his eyes. The aeroplane cabin rattles violently for a moment and then continuously for a sustained period. Hill opens his eyes and watches the South Americans laughing as they struggle to pour water from a bottle of Breck and Carreg into a silver hip flask without it spilling on the grubby metal floor. Happy maniacs, Hill thinks. Hill looks around the cabin. Two middle-aged women wearing charcoal business suits are talking and looking at a tablet. Two middle-aged men wearing white shirts tucked into chino shorts are talking and looking at a tablet. A woman in her 20s is gripping her armrest, her nails digging into the worn, faded material as she maintains a calm and stoic facial expression. Like Lucy, Hill thinks. Hill unmutes the volume on his iPhone and looks ahead. Hill becomes conscious of the aeroplane tilting, shuddering, and beginning to make its descent. Sign mode 2000 starts playing again. How many times, Hill thinks. Music to crash to, Hill thinks. Survival odds, Hill thinks. It's okay, Hill thinks. Hill looks ahead and shuts his eyes. Thank you very much, Richard. It's, it's a, 
it's a, such an intriguing start to the to the novel and quite a way to arrive on an is morn i think yeah. <laughs> it's, the best, it's the best way to get that i don't think I'm quite, gonna, yeah i'm going to stick the easy jet but um <laughs> it's the the book uh, the books had a, a wonderful uh, reception so far i sort of mentioned this at this time you know although this is the launch it has been available to read for um several months in various forms uh and it's uh, been shortlisted for not the guardian not the booker award uh which has created a lot of um interest worldwide uh in in, in your writing um and uh with requests to read it from, from many places or but also your first first book had a great reception in in Serbia, and you made a film about about your short story collection out there. Well, you say right about the not the booker first for you, and then the the Serbian story. Yeah, sure. Um, well, the not not the booker. Um, that's lovely. That's really nice. Uh, it got. I think it was, the shortlist was really cool, and then um, Sam Jordison. The guy who runs not the booker for the guardian um he gave it a really really great review and it was really nice that he liked it that was good um and then we'll see what happens on monday um if anyone has read the book or reads it over the weekend and they really like it they can place a vote um which will help um the book potentially for the finals they can, if you go onto the guardian you can find that um but yeah we'll see with that with with serbia um yeah, that's really cool. It was, um, I, I didn't make the film. I was the subject of the documentary, um, which is in uh, post-production, I believe. Uh, I, I've got like no, no kind of involvement with that at all. So that, that would be interesting. I mean, I won't, um, I won't watch that. That's, I will just, people will maybe watch it when it comes out and they can tell me what they think, but I won't, um, I, I won't be watching it. But, yeah, I, I really love Serbia. It was an amazing um, time to be there, and it was uh, people. People loved uh, what I did. They they really liked it, and they loved um, that I was from Wales, and we kind of exchanged a lot of interesting opinions about Wales and uh, Serbia and so on. And that was really cool. I I loved I loved it a lot. It was good. Um, it's a really nice place. Yeah, and the, the same publishers will be bringing out this this novel as well. I hope uh, next year, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think, and what what was really um, nice, I, th I think, about them was uh, similar, I guess, in some ways to what we have here, um, being like a, a small nation. It was kind of uh, there was a real sort of passion to put the books out, which I know you have, and that's you've had that for quite quite a long time now. Um, and it's similar, similar there, I think, in, in Belgrade, but also in other towns and cities in Serbia. Um, they're really passionate about uh, literature, um, and it's really important to them culturally as well, which was which was made it a pleasure to be there. Uh, Tristan, um, going back a little bit to your duality, how are you? You know, you've you you you've read in a couple of festivals. Um, in Canada, how do they perceive you there? I perceive you as a Welsh writer or a Canadian writer, or how do they look at you? Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I often, um, <laughs> it's. I, I think it's quite strange. So often when I'm when I'm uh, when I'm doing book things in in Canada, they'll um, they'll market me as a Canadian writer, and um, and then there'll be a kind of brief moments of confusion when I when I kind of go up to do my reading um, um, so yeah I think um, I think sometimes you, you you kind of yeah you you shift slightly so I'll, I'll, I'll be I'll be marketed as a Canadian writer but then once I've done my reading and um, especially if it's from one of um, uh, one of my Welsh books um, uh, then the conversation will then turn to uh, will then turn to Wales. So yeah, I guess I'll do a slight chameleon thing, really, where I'll be introduced as Canadian and then end up for questions as Welsh. 
because there seems to be a, a few Welsh Canadian connections. I mean, you're not the only Welsh Canadian novelist. I know, you? I know. I think it's a yeah. I think we we almost have a you know we almost have enough for a for a for quite a large dinner party now. Yeah, we won't be having that for a while. Not in uh, <laughs> Wales becomes Albania, but uh, <laughs> um, Richard, there's a, there's another fascinating character who moves in and out of your uh, novel. Um, although we never actually get to meet him, and this um, is this is the the film actor Jack Black. Um, have you had any contact with him since the books come out, or is he um, is he offering to buy the film rights again? Um. Well, he's not replying to my emails. Um, but, uh, maybe I, I don't know. I I love Jack Black. He's um, but like I I earnestly I think he's incredibly talented. He's um, I've kind of been into him since since day one in his career. Really, um, I think he's a, yeah. a fantastic dramatic actor as well as an incredible comedic actor. Um, but yeah, if he wants to contact me, um, I, you, my email is. You can find my email on the internet, so you can you can send me send me an email. Just to, just to explain it, the character in the book has has written a screenplay which Jack Black has optioned. Is that correct? Well, yeah, the um, Jack Black has optioned to remake a podcast as a film. Um, so it's quite a convoluted kind of situation, um, and then that has put Hill. I guess in that in-between stage where he's had a limited degree of success and then obviously that's a very exciting thing to happen but it, I mean and this is from the start of the novel this is clear it's probably not going anywhere or, or if it is going anywhere there's no sign of that happening um, and I guess it's again it's part of Hill's big uh, thing for him is about letting go, holding on too tight, um, or not holding on to the right things um, in his life. So yeah, it's uh, it's difficult. But I really, I mean, I've got like the utmost respect and love for Jack Black. He's uh, he's one of the best. Okay, um, uh, Tristan, returning to a sense of place, I guess, and and I, I sort of. Looking at you in that crypt that you live in, <laughs> um, and you've been in Cardiff off and on for a while now. Is, is there something in Cardiff that is offering itself to you in fictional terms yet? Um, um, I'm, I'm sure it will. Kind of, uh, I'm sure it will eventually. Um, 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 I, I, I keep thinking it's quite strange. I keep thinking, right, you know, for uh, you know, for my next book or my next story, I'm, I'm gonna. You know, um, I'm I'm gonna locate it somewhere kind of outside my door, and then usually by about the second sentence, it, it seems to have jumped back either to Annas or North, or Northern Ontario. So <laughs> I can't help myself. So I just, <laughs> but eventually, eventually, I think um, um, you know, eventually I would like to write something about Cardiff. I mean. It'd be an interesting time, I think, to be writing. Kind yeah. Of Cardiff. Um, yeah uh, Richard, you've just written uh, some uh, an, uh, fascinating essay for uh, Will's Arts Review on running. Hmm. So that's yeah. coming to terms with lockdown, I suppose, is it? Well, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that's interesting, Tristan, saying about um, it always switches if he tries to write about Cardiff. And then for me, I would say I'm, I can't imagine writing about Cardiff for fiction, and I, I think I said that earlier, but um, but in terms of non-fiction, because it's where I live, um, I'm, that will be how I write about Cardiff, I think. Like, and yeah, running for me has been big um, in lockdown. Like, I've, I mean, I wrote in that Wales Arts Review, I, like, the direction I run is kind of from West Cardiff out, outwards, and then kind of back. And I mean, and you see, I've seen like, it's like, um, a field of alpacas in Radish, um, who I, lo I love to see them. And there's one of them, I called him Humphrey, and I've actually fed him an apple. <laughs> <laughs> the bond, like, I've kind of built up with, with or, or, or rather what running has given me is, and I really, I love all the nature I see, and, and um, 
and rain or shine, you know, I'll go out running. And then in, in the lockdown, I will do my, I will kind of revert back to the set one hour exercise, if, if that's how it's going to be, um, which I kind of, I like because it was, you've got your one hour and you do your one hour and then there's no questioning it, you just do it. And I, I find that very freeing. Um, mm. uh, Tristan, you've talked about the process of writing, about writer's room, again, with the Wales Arts Review. And, mm -hmm. um, is is that do you do you put yourself in a position every year where you can write something else? Because sometimes it's there's so many ways to stop yourself writing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I try to actually, and um, um, it was quite funny with uh, with that writers' room where where <laughs> everyone else had much more kind of comfortable looking rooms, and and uh, I just got a little shack out by a lake in the woods in Canada. And it was uh, it, it was pretty primitive. Um, um, <laughs> so I think some I think some people asked me if I was okay after seeing my writer's room. Um, um, uh, but yeah, no. So I do try. I do try to um, uh, kind of carve out a space of time where that's all I'm thinking about. Uh, um, just because otherwise, I mean, it's 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 always easier to find reasons not to write, isn't it? And um, um, you know, you know, I won't lie. I'd heard of there are many times, and I'd dearly prefer just to go fishing. But I'm I'm trying to make sure I I have a period of the year when uh, when I'm chained to the desk. Uh, mm. I think it's quite important to me. Richard, how does it, how do you approach it? You know, you, you've written you've written a successful novel, no, but um, very soon people will be, be asking you that next question: What are you doing next? You know. Yeah. Well, I just um, what what in yeah, I'm 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 back to work and working writing, um, which I can I, I need I need to do that. That's kind of part of my like process as a person. But the in in terms of my, I was really amazed. I would love to work in a dilapidated cabin that I mean that sounds incredible um I did write a little bit of uh Hello Friend Who Missed You uh at my friend um Jennifer's chalet in in Caswell Bay uh, my wife reminding me specifically which way it was but yeah Caswell Bay um and that was that was I loved that that was having that tranquility um but on the other hand I, I'm just as happy in in the bedroom as it is now in in lockdown um it's just for me it's the surroundings aren't ultimately all that important it's just just opening and then typing that's the, that's the kind of that's all i need really and then the routine is is normal after that it's fine okay in the audience, the audience. but so if anybody's out there <laughs> if anybody, <laughs> I want to I I type in and send a question uh, we we can do that um, as, uh, and we have, we have some from Adam Smith here Richard Richard can you say something about the use of brand names in your work oh yeah how it relates to character and life in general do you worry this will ever date your work? Can you imagine writing without them? Um, no, Adam Smith. I do not worry about that. Um, I uh, I just think like who would ever who would ever forget about Waitrose? Um, Waitrose <laughs> is really today. It's not going anywhere. Um, and I think similar to everyone, like there's a huddle. Uh, I mentioned the brand of tablet huddle in the novel. Mm. Huddles, even even though they don't make them anymore, we still know what a huddle is uh so yeah i hope, hope that answers your question adam smith but the um could i imagine writing without them yeah definitely i think i could um it would be i think probably what i'm writing now will, would have less brand names uh because i think what i'm writing now covers a period that extends into the future um so rather than I, I would I, I would be I would be reluctant to invent brand names 
that might arise in the future. That doesn't seem interesting to me. Um, but any, anything that is set in the present day, um, yeah, I probably would because I think a brand name is just as relevant as, uh, or just as real as a, as a real object, really. Um, but it's just how you, how, how my brain works. But I think, I think most people see brand names like that, I think. I don't know, but um, maybe, maybe it's just me. I'm not sure. Uh, and also, I, and, yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. I was, really... I, I was going to add to that. I mean, I found that absolutely in Richard's novel that those those brand names were kind of integral to it, and they were um, they were they were telling us a lot, not only about the kind of texture of the world, but I, th I think also about the kind of characters, and they um, 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 they had that function as well. Um, um, I love the proliferation of, of of cable knit jumpers, um, and and also the the little side about, um, about you know, uh, about, about the island salt, because um, this gave me great delight. I remember, I remember going to, um, uh, I think I was in New York, and I was in this swanky kind of um, restaurant. They were saying, oh, we've got you this special salt. And I just remember looking at it thinking, oh, that's from just down the road from me. It doesn't seem quite as glamorous now, but you've just charged me four hundred and eighty-seven dollars for whatever food I'm about to put on it. Um, so yeah, I think things like that are, are just part of the fabric of that novel uh, um, for me. All right, has anybody else got a question out there? Um, as we'll have to busk a bit if not. Oh, oh um, we've got one from Gary, Gary Raymond. Question for both writers. Um, oh, oh, just at the moment, Gary and Amelia just got married this week. So, congratulations to Gary and Amelia. But then that's off the point a bit. But you know, but uh, since it's a, we would have, I would have done that in a proper launch anyway. So, question for both writers: Do you consider yourself political writers in your fiction? Did you get that, lads? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well. I think I'll leave that one for for Richard first. Um, um. Yeah, no, I, I can answer it. I, I, just, I look like Tristan was about to speak. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, every everything about me is political. Everything. Like I wake up and it's political all the time, all day, twenty four seven. So like, if just me, me, me is political. So you, yeah, definitely. Yeah, that, I mean. I guess I'm not like writing um, anything overtly political because it's fiction and stuff, but um, it could be taken as read that anything I'm saying is is born out of me and what I think about stuff. Um, so I guess on that level, yeah, hundred percent, Gary. Um. And yes, it sounds like I'm going to copy Richard's answer now. Um, I'm, I'm Should have having... gone first. <laughs> no, but I think in, in the sense that I, I don't think my writing is necessarily kind of overtly political in in some ways. But I mean, in others, I think I've come to realise that, of course, yes, you're making decisions all the time. Um, um, you know, choosing what you write about choosing kind of how you place it so so in that sense inevitably um um it, it, it in some ways has to be even if it's not as richard said tackling kind of overtly political subjects or or taking a overtly kind of political um viewpoint on a particular subject it it, it is just inherently just i think by the nature of the fact that that, that you're you're always making a series of choices, aren't you, um, with 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 writing? Thank you for that question, Gary. Thank you very much. Um, oh, um, question from Lloyd Harrison: uh, Where does the title Shattercoon come from? That's for Tristan. <laughs> um, well, I I should say uh, hello to Lloyd, my my nephew, and what a. Uh, what an excellent question, uh, um, um, Lloyd. Um, it is a geological feature. 
So I didn't know this until uh, until I I saw one. So it's where it's the aftermath basically of a meteor impact. So uh, when a meteor kind of the Earth, um, very often it'll generate. It's quite a rare occurrence, but it'll generate enough heat often to melt the earth, actually melt the dirt, so it becomes this kind of vitreous rock. Um, um, and so it leaves a kind of relic, like a crater. Um, and that's what a, a shatter cone is. It's, it's the impact from a, from a meteor um, hitting the earth. Thank, thank you, Lloyd. Um, any See, we wait for the next one to pop up. Um, this question is from Holly Squire. Um, how do you think the pandemic will influence your future writing? How has it changed your worldview as a novelist? Well, Tristan, you want to go first? Uh, sure, yeah, yeah. Um, I think the simple answer is I, I don't know how it will change my view as a novelist. I think, um, I think very often with these things, they take time to bed in. Um, and I think it maybe we're, you know, let's say we're literally right in the middle of it now. Um, um, so I think sometimes, uh, for me anyway, it, it takes quite a while for what's going on kind of in the world to kind of filter through for me to kind of digest it. So I think it, it, it'll probably take me a long while um, to digest what's happening now um, um, so I think I, I couldn't guess yet how I think this historical moment or, or this pandemic it, it will 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 influence me um, I'm sure it probably will um, um, but I don't think I could predict uh, what, what, what way it will influence me um, in, in the immediate term I think as a writer um, uh, it's made me feel yeah, it's really amped up my writer's guilt um, um, because I've, uh, especially during lockdown, where I keep on thinking I should be writing more because I'm in lockdown and, uh, you know, I'm not allowed to do lots of other things. Um, so, yeah, I think it makes me feel, uh, yeah, guilty as a writer. Richard, are you feeling guilty? No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I... No, um, but I think with um, just like my worldview, not really so much changed. I kind of made a decision um, where I just accept what happens with um, with a pandemic, and if there are restrictions or, or rules, I just kind of go along with them. That's fine. But I guess the only way I was this is a really cool question because I was talking about something similar to a friend and. Um, the way it's like, for example, um, I've been watching a lot of uh, 1990s thrillers, uh, films, movies, and um, I'm sure that will surely tap into something that I do down the line. The fact that I've gone back and watched maybe like 20, 25 or 30 movies from this period specific in one genre or with one kind of over kind of aesthetic. Um, so that's like definitely going to influence me like it would it would have to like influence me um but yeah generally speaking i can't like i don't know like I, i'm i'm not going to write a pandemic novel i i don't think i'm not going to do that I, probably because i'm not mega engaged with or interested in the science of it and, and that kind of stuff um it's just something that's happening and sometimes inconveniencing me um and sometimes i've had the odd moment of relatively existential kind of angst about it but generally i'm just kind of accepting and half living happily really um i'm just really getting into these movies thank you those are really interesting questions thank you for the answers um i was also thinking back to that oh, sorry just to add, add to that but don't you think i think sometimes we kind of register these these huge kind of historical moments kind of obliquely, don't you know? I think a, a lot of art, um, 
tackles it kind of obliquely. So, you know, thinking in terms of films, you know, if you watch in Invasion of the Body Snatchers, it's it's obviously about the Cold War, it's about McCarthyism, but but done obliquely, you know. So I think maybe the pandemic will be registered in, in, in ways that don't necessarily directly tackle it, but do, you know, in, in, in some imaginatively kind of inflected way. Well, that could be a Cardiff novel, Tristan, that moves very quickly to any smaller than Canada. <laughs> um, thank, thank you very much. I think I think we're coming to the end of this um, evening. It's we, we're down for an hour, and we're just about to come up to that. Um, I'd like to say thank you to Catherine again for organising it, and thank you very much, um, Tristan and Richard, uh, for for writing these uh, fascinating books. Um, um, people get a chance to, to read them if they haven't read them already. They are definitely uh, definitely worth reading. We could, and you can have a signed copy of either book. Um, you can go to shelf life book, shelf, shelflifebookshop.com and there's a code. I think you probably can see that up on the screen. Can you, can you see that, gentlemen? Um, yeah. yeah. If not, um, the, the, we can send you the code. It's EF1TWPI. EF1TWPI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, Ro yeah, so Rose, there are signed copies available at Shelf Life. So, please support this wonderful new bookshop. Uh, we will be having more events later in the year. Um, Di Smith is talking to John Gower in a week or so. Uh, Peter Lord's got a new book out. Uh, Gary Raymond's um, writing about how love actually ruined Christmas. Um, so, there's plenty of reading out there. That's, I think, was one of the Great pleasures of lockdown is well, is the the breadth of reading has been available. I know I've been reading all sorts of books that I've meant to for years. So I hope I hope people are managing to do that as well. So, but here's two new ones: um, Shattercone and Hello Friend, We Missed You. Uh, and please vote for it if you haven't <laughs> soon. Um, so good luck for good luck for Monday, Richard. We'll be wait we wait in we waiting for you. Um, and then we we'll, we get the reprint in very quickly if you win it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, thank thank you very much. I think Catherine, do you want to wind up, or is that is that enough? No, that's great. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for coming, and this will be available on YouTube um, afterwards to watch afterwards. So share it if you enjoyed it, and head over to Shelf Life to buy your copy if you haven't already read it. Thanks everyone.